There is a dark side to banking that is so hidden that most people never know the sinister details. I went to some basement with about 100 other bankers and then these two women took out an assortment of marital aids and just proceeded to with each other while people were doing and people were watching. But slowly but surely, the truth is unraveling and more and more people are coming out of the woodwork to talk about their experiences behind the scenes and how truly sick those running the world's money really are. There's something grotesque about a hundred men in suits watching two women going at it hammer and tongs. But to begin with, we need to understand a few things. What is trading? How does it work? Trading is buying and selling stock, shares or crypto. But because the market is so swamped, the main business and most of the money is about predicting financial trends. It's a form of gambling on which stocks or shares will sell. The object is always to buy at a low price and then sell at a high price. Traders will sometimes buy and sell on the same day, otherwise known as day trading. The other way of making money is to find a client who agrees to a set price. The client thinks they are securing their money at the fixed price, factoring the market might drop. But then the trader waits for the market to drop on that stock and then buys it while it's low, knowing he can sell it to the client who has agreed on that fixed price. Now let's say a trader buys stocks in a pharmaceutical company to paint a better picture, but then he reads in the news that the FDA is concerned about a certain ingredient. He also reads that people enjoy coffee, particularly ground coffee. He will now sell the pharmaceutical company stocks or shares as quickly as he can before the FDA pulls the plug, takes that money, and moves it to the ground coffee stock. He knows he isn't the only one who reads about ground coffee and people tend to follow trends. So by reading about it, the seed is planted and people will buy ground coffee just to see what the hype is all about. Some traders will watch the market and only get tipped when it's too late. Like if the stocks fall because the FDA stopped the pharmaceutical company from production. And now there's a huge loss. So knowing behind the scenes what's really happening in the world pays off. By having knowledge and a vast network work of people under your disposal, you can understand the entire world and predict the future before it's even happened. People at the top of the banking industry, Jamie Dimon, are geniuses at this. They know everything that's going on with the world, constantly up to date with news in all different markets, and it results in these companies being worth trillions. I wake up usually at 4.30 or 5, I read five papers you'll be happy to hear in a very specific form. So I flip through the post, because everyone else does it. Uh, I read the front page of the Washington Post, then I read the New York Times front section beginning to end, all of it. Then I read the Wall Street Journal, front section, exchange next. Then I do a lot of other reading, by the way, both internal mail, Axios, you know, Politico, uh, stuff like that. If you know what you're doing, there is serious money to be made. The world's money. And by controlling this money, you control the debt of nations, companies, and can predict the future markets, making you one of the most powerful people in the world if you're at the top of the game. It is different from investing, where you have to wait a couple of years to see the profit growth. It is the here and now, and it's a fast way to make insane amounts of money. So of course, this is very appealing. And even at the lower level, people get paid bank. Bonuses can sometimes be up to six times your salary. And the fact is this high blood pressure world is extremely addictive to many. The more money you make, the more spoils come with it. You live in a place like New York, you hang out with a network of people who are the most influential in the world, and suddenly you find yourself in a hamster wheel of never wanting to leave this place. Always constantly searching every day for the next win. The job is glorified by movies. And as your ego balloons, it's an almost impossible life to escape. However, due to the nature of the business, the wealthy often look out for their own. The people who run the banks, the giant investment funds, their entire network is extremely enclosed with some of the most powerful people in the world and their families. This exclusivity ensures that only the best and brightest, those who meet the highest requirements of dedication, intelligence, wealth, class, and stubborn nature are part of this elite world. So everyone, all of these guys from rich families, their families knew this and they'd be making sure they had this extra extracurricular stuff. So like this guy would have been head of the junior United Nations or this guy would have like founded a charity that like drives dirt bikes through the Sahara Desert for some reason. Like, this guy would have like played the oboe at the Royal Albert Hall. You know? Outsiders can still have a chance to get in, but it's almost impossible. And as you go down the pyramid, this system still applies almost everywhere. To get into the world in the first place, you have to be extremely good at mathematics and have a higher education degree, usually from an Ivy League school. And you realize straight away, the game has been rigged against you. And of course I lost enormously because this thing that happened is basically statistically impossible. And um, I was sort of sitting there in this, like it was on the, in this like high floor in the Citibank skyscraper, just asking myself like, why have they rigged the game against me? And then the guy who, run the games, comes to the front and he says the winner of the game was Gary Stevenson. And uh, he said we wanted to see what, what he would do if everything turned out against him. We wanted to see someone who would back himself and he did. One employee won his job in a card game called the Trader's Card Game. The object is to guess the joint number of cards so that if you have a low card, chances are you will bet a low figure. Citibank hires one trader a year through a card game. 
It's called the trading game, and if you win it, you can get an internship. However, this candidate has been briefed on how to play it before the game even started, probably because of his connections and networking already in the world to begin with. And so instead of playing the odds, he flipped the game by joining the two opponents' as cards and then bet on a higher figure. And although he did have the advantage as he was briefed on how it works prior, most candidates are left to figure this out on their own. Once you win the first game, you play with other candidates until the final game. Then the bankers choose the best of the best, and suddenly you're in the pyramid. And once you're in, riding on this grand sense of achievement sets the tone for your career. When you first step onto the trading floor, it's a mass of computer screens and highly amped up employees. You get taken up these escalators in this massive, massive room. Trading floor is so vast, enormous room. Like you walk in and it seems to like endless, like right, left, forwards. And it's, everyone has these massive walls of screens. Nine screens, 12 screens that kind of go up around them like this. Fighting to be the best, bring in the most and play the game. Highly caffeinated, stimulated on other substances beyond belief. In the heart of a giant mega city. And just like that, the addiction to the game begins. Your entire lifestyle suddenly changes to suit your job as a trader. You need to be a work early and you need to know what's going on in the world. So keeping updated by watching the news constantly, contacting other traders, reading emails and data analysis reports on the economy is imperative. You have to go to networking parties. You have to understand the top players in the entire world. Politicians and CEOs have to be in your phone contacts. And as the competition is so cutthroat, you have to do everything and anything to win, even if it has disastrous consequences. For this reason, it's said that sociopaths often do well as CEOs and traders. It's the perfect job for a psychopath. If you look at what psychopaths are, and I'm not talking about Hannibal Lecter here, I'm talking about actual, normal, everyday psychopaths. They are manipulative. They are often charming. They hate jobs that require serious qualifications. They are people who don't show remorse or have empathy. If you have no empathy, not a care in the world whose lives have been destroyed, you have a false charm around you, and you have an insatiable greed, you have all the skill sets ready to run this world. You know, like I always remember in 2011, the Japanese nuclear disaster. I made a ton of money on the Japanese nuclear disaster. N not because I'd been expecting it to be a Japanese nuclear disaster, but because I was betting on economic weakness. You bet on economic weakness, this crazy thing happens that there's no way you could have predicted, you make a ton of money. If for example you knew that bad weather would destroy crops, you would quickly buy into a sea company knowing that farmers would have to start all over again, and maybe even playing a part in trying to get this bad weather to destroy crops so that you can wait on their demise to profit on humanity. On the flip side, if a sociopath loses big for a client or stabs in the back their work friend to gain more profit, it doesn't really matter because you can just move on to the other person and invest in something else and work with other people, never even having a single care about the person that you've been speaking to, and you also have to manipulate your way to the top. To get to the upper echelons of this industry, you have to be incredibly charming and know what to say. If you do, one client can bring in more clients. Suddenly you have a network of highly successful people in your phone contacts, and the more of this, the more profit you make if you know what you're doing. There was a lot of people getting taken out to expensive restaurants and clubs and taken out to holidays. I got taken to Vegas when I was 21, before I, I went to Jay-Z's after party in LA. And then I went to Carmen Electra's birthday party. I hadn't even started working full time. Suddenly you have inside information. You can almost predict what's going to happen and profit from this because it's all about what you know, who you know, and when to buy and sell. Brokers are known to take traders out to top shelf restaurants and strip clubs and will go as far to even pay for prostitutes in hopes of making their commissions. In the UK alone, brokers spend up to £30,000 or more forming relationships that could potentially swing them the business. It's a two way street. Brokers spend a lot of money on them and traders refer their clients to brokers. And if you're able to do all of this, you'll be invited to the most lavish VIP parties and functions, where the true debauchery begins. This is where the drugs come in. Hookers, giant sex parties. Doing it and suddenly everyone started giggling and I was thinking what the f is going on here and suddenly I saw this blood hit onto my white shirt and I was like oh my god and I've got a massive coke related <laughs> nostril bleed all over my crisp white shirt and suddenly you can get information about everyone else at this party if you ever need to blackmail them or manipulate them into doing what you need them to do as some traders get sucked into a world that they're not prepared for there was a trader who told a story of one party where the bankers were all sitting in a basement in a circle while watching two women have sex in the middle while they all watched and snorted drugs. I went to some basement with about 100 other bankers and there were this semicircle of plastic chairs and we all sat there, all men, and then these two women took out an assortment of marital aids and just proceeded to have sex with each other while people were doing coke and people were watching and, and then they got some people in the front row 
and then just started f***ing them. This forms a sacred bond between you and the other sociopaths in your elite club of secrecy where anything goes. And because you're working with people who run the law, you can almost do anything and never face a single consequence. There are no moral standards or limits to what you can get away with. But suddenly the people above you have you in their grasp. Now they know your dirty secrets, they can always control you and use you as a puppet, all while you feel invincible. And of course, on top of this, you'll have to sign a non-disclosure agreement. So if anyone ever wanted to talk about this, they would not be legally allowed to, and the best lawyers would be on their case if they ever did. Sued into the ground, and God knows what else. Which means these events are mostly swept under the rug. That's why you never hear about any of this stuff, or anyone even in the finance industry to begin with. With the use of drugs like coke, it's no surprise that an inflated ego, a lot of money, and a sense of endless power would end in tragedy for some. Typically, all it takes is the wrong personality type in this trade to push the limits of what they can get away with. The evil British banker Rurak Juting was in Hong Kong when he was 29. He took home two Indonesian ladies from the red light district at separate intervals, and then proceeded to torture them to death days apart. He even filmed the torture involving pliers, sex toys, and his belt. The first to die had their throat cut in the toilet bowl, and was then put in a suitcase on the outside balcony. The second victim suffered the same fate with her throat slit and just left in the apartment. Before he turned himself in, he left a voicemail saying, quote, I'm out of the office indefinitely. For urgent inquiries, or indeed any inquiries, please contact someone who's not an insane psychopath. For escalation, please contact God, though suspect the devil will have custody. Just like something straight out of American Psycho, he then took more drugs and called his boss before calling 911, and he's now rightfully serving two life sentences in Hong Kong prison. However, even those at the top of the game are still committing illegal acts on a day-to-day -day basis, especially with insider trading, a term used when someone in the trade has privileged access to non-public information and uses it to trade. Insider trading happens all the time because people in the city aren't satisfied just with their six-figure salaries and their six-figure bonuses. They want to get even more money. And while it is illegal, it's almost never enforced. Even people like Nancy Pelosi have allegedly been blatantly doing it with absolutely no repercussions, as her financially powerful and well-connected husband does all the investing for them while she supposedly provides private information about government action to him, all so that they can predict what will work and what won't, allegedly. In the two years following the 2008 financial crisis, the Pelosi's estimated net worth grew from $31 million to over $100 million. That's up 220%, all while the S&P 500 fell by 13%. The Pelosi's also did super well during the pandemic, seeing their net worth jump from $106 million to $171 million within like the two years of the pandemic. That's an increase of 60% during the pandemic. And I say this because the big flaw in the system is that it's almost impossible to prove. However, there are of course some cases of people getting prosecuted for insider trading, as you need baits to make an example of, to cover your own crimes. Martha Stewart is one example of someone convicted of insider trading in 2004, as Martha Stewart sold her shares on the stock market in a pharmaceutical trade pending FDA approval, which allowed her to avoid significant loss. The ongoing investigation of Martha Stewart and allegations of insider trading. She faces federal charges that she lied about using inside information to make a profit on a stock trade. Raj Bataranam was a billionaire manager of a hedge fund who was convicted of one of the biggest insider trading cases in history. Raj Rajaratnam, a former billionaire described by the government as the modern face of illegal insider trading, has been sentenced to 11 years in prison. He had been receiving confidential information from a number of insiders, and he was made an example of, and his case was recognized as a big win in closing in on insider trading. However, if any trader could sell before they lose the money, even on a rumor, it's just another day in trading. And most of the times, the lines are so blurred about what is confidential or unfair. It's easy to see how a trader would act on something they should not know to stop a huge loss or to make a huge profit. The question is, why have we not seen more bankers and traders go to jail for insider trading? Well, it's all about who you know or who you have in your pocket. The odds are already in their favor as insider trading is very hard to prove. But also knowing some high-level CEOs, attorney generals, or perhaps US attorneys who will protect their own agenda at all costs is very helpful. Now, a few movies have given us a glimpse on what it used to be like. Movies like The Wolf of Wall Street and The Big Short pull the curtain back on how wicked the world of trading was. Was, and perhaps still is. We think of traders on Wall Street with everyone shouting and buying and selling, but this is hardly the case anymore. The world instead has obviously gone online, and certain aspects of the industry have changed dramatically. Salaries have increased, so earnings are still high, but bonuses are now being capped at double your salary. Cap bonuses are still good incentives, but not as productive as uncapped bonuses. Regardless, the clients will always want to treat or reward their traders, so the VIP parties and functions still happen. While most companies will avoid hiring drug addicts, to be in this industry, you have to almost become one. 
And most bosses really don't care, as long as the money's coming in, it's to their benefit. And how you do it really doesn't matter, as long as it's done. I remember being so deluded at one point that my wife and I drove, my second wife now, the one from the movie, the blonde, we were driving in our car home in these huge mansions in Locust Valley, and we're looking around, like, everyone must do quaaludes, right? <laughs> and you couldn't be going through the world so, but sure. now the truth is most of them are wasps drinking scotch, you know, just sure. to, to go through life. But the point is, is that you actually start to convince yourself that everyone is doing what you're doing. So the anyone can now try the hand at trading through apps like Forex, but this is still really just a small play, especially compared to these big guys. Gary Stevenson from Gary's Economy Channel explains that trading is very dangerous. You see, he was one of the best traders in the world who had his ups and downs in his short life as a trader. And even though he still trades, he is cautious and advises people that trading is addictive, as he lost $8 million in just one week and had to fight his way back in trading. A hugely expensive lesson, both on his body, mind, and wallet. So I was only once ever in the red, which was in my Second full year as a trader in 2010, I'd put a big bet on which had some risk to Swiss interest rates and the Swiss central bank suddenly cut rates to negative four and a half percent for some crazy reason, um, specifically using the, the product that I was betting on. I lost $8 million in a week. The maddest thing about it was, it was the right bet. If I was allowed to keep that position, I would have made it all back. I wasn't allowed to keep that position, so you end up $4 million in the red and you have to fight your way out of it. All of these trading apps are built to make you think you know what you're doing, so you keep trading until you lose everything. Gary has experience behind him and seems to understand what to look for when he trades. The difference is that Gary no longer trades with clients' money but with his own, as he openly says that trading is pretty much just gambling no matter which way you cut it. And because Gary was the best in the world at one point, when he tried to leave or quit, his boss took him out to lunch and in a very indirect way threatened him. Towards the end of my career, I decide I want to leave and I tell my boss I want to leave. And my boss takes me out for this dinner and he told me a story about a, a, a trader, a young trader at Deutsche Bank, who, you know, nice guy, good trader, wanted to leave. The only problem is, Deutsche didn't really want him to leave, you know? So they went through all of his, looked through some of his past trades and his emails, you know? There wasn't really anything in there, but there was enough, you know? There was, a, you know what I mean? Enough to take him to court and, he rolled through court for years and years, and eventually the guy was bankrupted. And that was when Gary would realise the threat was almost done in a gangster way, and so then he would set out to get himself fired, which he would later do. And in the end, two things happened simultaneously, which is I start sending these mad emails every day to like the CEO and the global head of HR. One guy got fired. And then I get let out. However, Gary's story really just shed light on how dark and twisted the trading banker life really is, and how it almost resembles a cult like membership. If you don't get addicted to trading, getting out is still hard because if you're their golden ticket, the powers that be, i.e., the very powerful people controlling all of the money, and you're making them hefty profits, they will threaten lawsuits, and possibly even worse, like blackmailing you at one of these VIP parties to make sure you never leave. The idea is if you've been in this life, you at some point or another would have done something illegal, something with your co-workers on these big Friday nights, where everything could secretly be recorded, and once the people above you have this knowledge on you, they can make you their puppet, and force you to keep on trading for them. Now it's admirable that Gary has seen a serious problem with trading, and yet today in popular culture, this line of work is still heavily promoted. From everywhere, from TikTok to YouTube to movies, promotes this banking trading sort of lifestyle. And yet the SEC has warned that one must be prepared to suffer severe financial loss, and that day trading is not only an extremely stressful job, but a very expensive one. In a 14 year study of day trading, only 1% of traders constantly earned money. This sounds like no one is making money, but that's not really the case at all. This means traders will lose money, but it's the client's money, and only a portion is the bank's cut. High risk trades can and do pay off, but they can just as easily go for broke. Some traders resort to junk bonds where the commission is high, but there is no value in what they have traded. The commission is safe, so the trader walks away smiling while the client takes the hit. This is the case in the movie The Wolf of Wall Street, which was based on a true story, and the guy is still talking about this stuff today. And whilst this is illegal and we've come a long way from then, this doesn't mean we've escaped the same sort of trading problems. They've just been renamed, repackaged, and re-strategized by the powers that be. And what goes on behind closed doors? with the people who run the world, who fund the debt, who pay off governments, who buy up homes across the country, are truly living a life unrecognizable to the majority of us. 